What are you thinking right now? Maybe science has the answer. How can science read your mind? This is the University of the Netherlands. You've probably had an experience where someone asked you, are you trying to read my mind? Or maybe you said the exact same thing at the exact same time as a friend of yours. And it feels like they can read your mind. But of course, that's just a joke. Mind reading isn't something we can really do. Or is it? As a social psychologist, I use science to try to come up with a smart method to get closer to reading people's minds. In this lecture, I will explain how I try to do that. Of course, we can't just read your mind. We can't simply hook you up to a machine and find out what you're thinking. It seems like reading people's minds can be nothing more than a magic trick. Nevertheless, it matters a lot for science and society to find out what people are thinking. So how can we do it? You might think, why don't we simply ask people what they're thinking about? That seems like a pretty straightforward way to solve the problem, right? And it's a method we social scientists use a lot. But the just asking method also comes with some problems. Let's think those through. One problem could be that people might not be comfortable answering truthfully. Let's say I ask you about your political views or your opinion on a controversial topic or your sexual preferences. Chances are you might not want to say what you're really thinking. Another problem is that when I ask you what you're thinking, I interrupt your thought process. Here's an example. What are you thinking about right now? A second ago, you were thinking about this lecture and about following my arguments. But now you're thinking about answering my question about what you're thinking. See, I read your mind there, didn't I? But this means I have disturbed your thought process and even changed it. But I wanted to know about your actual unperturbed thought process. So when we measure thought processes, we want a method that can measure them without disturbing them. And then, even when you do tell me what you're thinking about, not all questions can be answered easily. For example, if you like someone, can you tell me exactly why you like them? Sometimes you feel like your heart just knows, but you can't really explain what's going on. We often talk about having a gut feeling too, and that's a shorthand for knowing what we want to choose, but not being able to describe why we want it or how we decided what to do. Even worse, sometimes your mind can play tricks on you. Let me tell you about an experiment done in the 60s to illustrate that point. This experiment dealt with participants who were afraid of snakes. One group of participants was led to believe that they were wired to a device that showed their heartbeat on a monitor while they saw pictures of snakes or received mild electric shocks. They watched what they thought was their heartbeat speed up when they received the shock, but not when they saw a snake. The other group of participants were led to believe that the signal on the monitor had nothing to do with their heartbeat. After this, both groups were asked to approach a real snake. It turned out that the group who was led to believe they watched their heartbeat had less trouble approaching and even touching the snake. Why was that so? Their minds were tricked into believing that their hearts beat faster when seeing and receiving the shock, which they took as a sign of being scared of the shock. But for the snakes, their hearts did not beat faster, giving them the impression that they weren't actually scared of the snakes. This experiment shows that your mind can be tricked and that you don't always understand what you think or feel. So to figure out what someone is thinking about, it would be good if we didn't have to assume that they themselves know their own thought process. So what other methods do we have that could help us do this? If you've been on a date, maybe you try to read someone's mind through their eyes. Maybe they can stop looking at you and you take that as a sign of their affection. Or do they look away a lot and maybe even at the next table so that they don't seem very interested? Looking at someone's eyes can reveal a lot about what they're thinking. On a date, getting lost in each other's eyes is a pretty common strategy for soul searching. In the lab though, it would be pretty weird and imprecise if an experimenter wistfully stared into the eyes of the participants to figure out what they're thinking about. 
Luckily, we have technology that can do this, but better. Eye tracking. Eye trackers are cameras that capture what you're looking at and how dilated your pupil is. In research, we can use this technology during experiments, for example, to follow your eye movements while you think about solving a problem. By studying the patterns of your gazes and your pupils, we can get better insights into people's thought processes. We can learn which information you simply ignore, the information you hardly look at. Which information is important for your decision because it receives a lot of attention. And we can also learn something about how difficult it is for you to decide. For example, if you look back and forth between two options presented to you. We use the tracking of eye movements during experiments in the lab. Let's take a look at one of these experiments. Imagine we have 10 euros and you get to decide how to share it between you and me. And in the experiment, we would use actual money you could keep. There are two options. Either you share the money evenly, this is option A, or you go for option B, where you keep all the money and leave me empty-handed. So this experiment is about whether you are pro-social and share your resources, or if you're more selfish and prefer to keep everything to yourself. We can easily find out which option you would prefer. We simply ask you to choose, and then we know. But how can we find out how you made that choice? What were you thinking about? With eye tracking, we can measure where you look and how long you look at the information presented. Do you immediately look at option A and keep looking at option A? Do you go back and forth between A and B? And in doing so, do you only look at how much money you get out of the experiment? Or do you also look at the information of how much money I will receive? We can find out if you're at all interested in how much money I could get, or if you only look at your own outcomes and make decisions regardless of what's in it for me. We can also find out if you're having a hard time making up your mind, in which case you would look back and forth between the options more. Now, that's not exactly mind reading either, but it's a pretty good attempt if you ask me. We can do experiments that get closer and closer to reading your mind, but we still need to figure out how to interpret the data we get and how to make inferences about people's thoughts. In other words, we need to make sure that the conclusions we draw from data about people's thoughts are actually correct. One challenge here is what we call false positives. Here's an example for this problem, the SALMON study. In this study, researchers were setting up an fMRI machine, which you use to measure brain activity. The researchers put different things into the machine for fun to see if they would pick up a signal for brain activity. They tried a pumpkin first. Well, that doesn't have a brain, so the machine didn't pick up that it was thinking. Next, they tested the machine with a dead, defeathered hen. Again, a dead chicken doesn't have brain activity, so the machine didn't show any. Finally, one of the researchers went to the store to buy a large dead salmon. They placed it in the fMRI and measured if it had any brain activity. Now, of course, the dead salmon couldn't have any brain activity, but still, if they ran enough tests on the data, the results looked like the dead salmon was thinking. How can that be? When you do a lot of tests, some of them will turn out positive at random due to error. This was the case for the salmon. It showed activity in some of the tests, even though it was definitely not thinking, because it was dead. This study showed that it's important to correct for these random errors so that you can be a bit more sure that the inferences or interpretations you make after running an experiment are not wrong. Of course, when you attempt to read people's minds, you don't want to fall for a fluke. You want to learn what people are actually thinking about. The SALMON study also showed that it is important to share openly how an experiment is done and to share the data from the experiment so that others can form good opinions about how trustworthy the results are. In other words, science needs to be open and transparent. By not only sharing what we do, but also how we do it, we keep expanding our knowledge. Of course, it sounds pretty cool to be able to read people's minds, but coolness is not the only reason we are trying to do this. 
if we can measure what people are thinking about, we can learn more about what motivates them to make the choices that they make. Perhaps we can even learn how suboptimal choices arise and why our minds sometimes play tricks on us. You've probably felt like you've made a bad choice at some point and afterwards you asked yourself why you fell for that bad option. Or maybe you're not aware of some of the suboptimal choices you're making. If we understand how this happens, we can develop interventions that could help people make better decisions in their everyday lives. We started this lecture with the question, how can science read your mind? We know that the answer is, we cannot read people's minds. But you also saw that there are some methods that can at least help uncover what people are thinking about. And maybe in the future, we will get even closer to being able to read minds. But until then, mind reading is only for psychics and magicians. Thank you for watching.